Hello and welcome to Wisdom and Productivity, the podcast of Dr. Efraim Martinez. I am a principal in search of wisdom, and I have found productivity to be a great tool for success. Today, I have the great honor of interviewing Ken Wallace, who is the superintendent of Maine Township High School District 207 in Park Ridge, Illinois. I love following him on Twitter. I get to see the superintendents are humans too. Ken Wallace, who are you? Well, good morning, uh, Efren, good morning. and uh, thank you for having me. Um, who am I? That's a really good question. Well, first of all, I I'm 61 years old. So when you're 61 years old, who, who are you is a, is a big compilation of a lot of things, and it's about your journey. Um, I grew up in a small town. Uh, my um, grandmother and grandfather were very influential in my life. They were both children of the Depression. Both of them, in one way or another, uh, were the oldest. Though they were both the oldest. My mother, my grandmother was the oldest of 13. My grandfather was the oldest of three. And they both, at very early ages, had to really take care of their mothers and their, and their younger siblings. Um, my grandfather was a Golden Gloves boxing champion in the Army in World War II, trained Army platoons. And then after the war, went to work for Whirlpool. And in 1947, my grandmother, who was just this amazing woman, Ada Wallace, started a business in my hometown. So I grew up with a family that uh, was just trying to build something and worked really hard at it. It was a good time in this country to be doing it. You know, the post-World War II economic boom was 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 really good for many people. And my grandmother and grandfather uh, benefited from that. But I saw, you know, how they worked, um, how they served others. They were both very committed to serving their communities and serving others less fortunate. Um, I had several um, influential teachers along the way. And I, I was a, I was a wrestler and, and um, my, my high school wrestling coach, Ed Ziller, was very influential. Um, I, I got into education at an early age in one way or another, probably coaching wrestling first and just became fascinated with how to create learning in humans. And, and if you're really paying attention, whether you're a coach or a teacher, and I use those words uh, simultaneously and inter interchangeably, um, if you really get into that piece of the puzzle, uh, it can really just, um, energize you and, and inspire you. And, and I've been on a search for most of my life on trying to not just think about how humans learn best, but how to create those conditions where um, you can you can create at scale conditions where humans can be their very best. And, and uh, in our in our space, it's called, you know, in search of collective efficacy, you know, that's the holy grail in education. And, and so I've been fortunate enough. I was a high school English teacher and journalism teacher. I taught middle school computer science for six years after that, uh, when I went back to my hometown to be the head wrestling coach. And all of those things were really important uh, on my educational journey. So I would just say, who am I? I'm, I'm still trying to figure all that out, but I'm in search of, you know, how to support learners, both adult and student learners, Uh, be their very best because you, in our space in education, the the learning is a parallel structure. Uh, in schools, one of the most common mistakes is we really hyper focus on the student learning, which is important. Obviously, arts are core mission, but we don't put as much bandwidth and thought and and design thinking into um, the construction and the conditions for the adult learners. And I'm a, I'm a firm believer that you've got to have the, you know, the same way you've got these learning pathways for students in my district. Now, you know, we've got learning pathways for the adults. So we've really constructed uh, a, a framework to con continue to grow our adults. So that's a long answer to a simple question, but I, I'm, a, I'm just a guy in search of trying to continue to learn and hopefully um, develop schools and people within schools that, that, um, create the best possible learning conditions to support our students. Beautiful. Thank you, Ken. Uh, I, I love your answer, by the way. Um, let me try to peel that onion a little bit more. Can you tell us, can you 
do a brief reflection on the approach or philosophy on on the teacher or administrator as a coach and uh what does that mean um i think i have a very good idea but i would love to see your reflection on that so i actually started really when i was a uh, middle school computer science teacher i also was basically the building technology coach and whenever you know i i, I was in charge of ordering all the materials for the building and, and making sure that um i was supported um our teachers to roll out technology and um i just found that um both from an experience standpoint as a teacher what often happens and uh and the research is really really clear on it not you know jim knight's got a lot of research as do as do many others if you just bring a bunch of teachers into a room and you say here's a technique uh, let me show you this technique. Here's some literature about the technique. Here's some things you can watch about the technique. And then you dismiss everybody and you say, now go implement that technique into your classroom. You're lucky if 10% of the teachers really ever do that. Uh, the missing ingredient uh, always in, um, in the research and in practice has been coaching people through the learning cycle to do that. And there's a whole bunch to that. Um, in education, we do the exact opposite of the thing that would promote better learning. Humans are wired to learn. Uh, we will try to solve problems um, at, just continuously. If I put a, a, a letter box up and with letters and I put K space space W space space L space C space, the human brain would automatically just try to solve that puzzle because that's how we're wired to solve. And you'll do it continuously. You actually can produce a dopamine drip. Um, if you study neuroscientists and people that know learning science, uh, Judy Willis, for example, will say, you know, the real trick in the classroom is to get your kids addicted to learning. And that's a real thing because you activate the, the pleasure centers of the brain if you do it well. The thing that stops it is punishment for being wrong. And because what ends up happening then is, is you move away from that prefrontal cortex operation and you, you activate the amygdala, which is the fight or flight part of the brain. And if you can create the conditions where one, failure is useful and failure is something from which to learn, um, that's a really important condition to operate in. But the coaching and, and in District 207, um, we're in our ninth year of coaching every teacher every year. Every one of our teachers has an annual coaching plan uh, for their entire career. And we're about to the point where we're about half of our teachers have only ever known that landscape um, because they've been with us for the most of their, for most of their career. And in just a few years, you know, it's going to be everyone. So that's going to be a really cool thing um, as you sort of visualize what this could look like at scale. Because what we've seen in our district is that, the coaching of adults has been transformational, not just for the adults, but for our student learning conditions, because we practice many of the very same strategies uh, with our adults that we practice in the classroom. And I can give you several examples of that. But but to, to answer your question, the coaching really is teaching our adults in a non-judgmental, non-evaluative way. And those two things are really, really important um, to work through um, problems of practice to develop their own efficacy and to be in search of finding their best self, which um, the thing about learning is you're never done. And um, I, I remember years ago, uh, some folks that I worked with, they were trying to get master's degrees because on, on our pay scale, if you had so many master's degrees, you were sort of at the top of the scale. And I remember one one person in particular just celebrating the fact, I'm never gonna have to take another class. I'm never taking any more classes. And the thing that's important to know, because we're in the human learning business, and, and if you pay attention to the science of learning, we continue to learn new things. So paying attention to best practices, things that have happened, successes that others are having and how they did it is absolutely, I think, a, an ethical requirement in our space. It's like a doctor practicing medicine in many ways, except in my opinion, the stakes are just as high or higher and it's more complex um, because you're, you're, 
you're interacting with all of these different humans, each of whom is, is uh, distinct and individual. And, um, and the complexity with that is just, it's, it's miraculous, but it's also fascinating. And I think inspiring if you go at it from the place where, I, how do I take, in, our, in my district, it's 6,400 students. How do I personalize their experiences so that each one of them has the best support to have the very best trajectory in life? That's how you change the world. And it really is, it really is the whole concept of not leaving anybody behind. Um, I've got a big, diverse district. Uh, 60% of our students uh, have uh, uh, a second language spoken in the home of their, you know, their, their, their primary home. Uh, almost 50% of our students at one point in their educational careers have been second language learners. We've got students literally from all over the world. Uh, we have 70 newcomers this year, uh, both as a result of uh, the Venezuelan immig immigration um, crisis. And then also Ukraine, we've got Ukrainian and Russian immigrants uh, because of the crisis over there. And then that's, a, that's not a new story. That's, a, that's the American story. Uh, my ancestors, your ancestors, most people's ancestors came from somewhere else in search of a better life to this country. And um, while people want to politicize that in education, you know, um, our job is to meet students at the door, literally, when they show up and support them to be their very best self. And so that's a that's not a job for me. That's a calling. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, Ken, let me, one more follow-up question. Um, as an aspiring superintendent, what advice would you give to someone who, who believes like you that every teacher should have coaching, but, you know, that is obviously not happening in every school district? Is this something that you, that you put in your application and your, your, your proposal that that is your plan? So when they interview you, they know what is the approach that you are bringing, or is that is something uh, that that will scare some boards away uh, from hiring you? It's a really good question, and I was lucky enough in my current district to uh, I started here as the assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction, so I had oversight for adult learning and mm -hmm. built some important relationships with our adult learning leaders and our union uh, leadership and was lucky enough to get an agreement with our union to have um, really, and I, the word we use was firewalled uh, coaching that would be uh, separate and protected from the evaluation process. And in fact, our, our coaches are union members and that's by design. Um, we, you know, um, it's certainly an administrator can do coaching, but the purest form of coaching really needs to be non-evaluative. Um, but to answer your question, it really depends. I mean, you can make what what I think if I were in 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 that position uh, that you just described, I would say that I I'm going to be a supporter of growing and supporting our adults to be their very best self, to be the best learners possible in order because there's a symbiotic relationship between that happening and your student uh, learning. They, they 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 are not exclusive in any way. They're they're interlocked. If you have a trajectory where your adults continue to learn, that's a parallel journey to your students. And I think what happens if you don't have really good learning conditions for adults, it stagnates not just for them, but then for students. So I think I would tell a board, uh, you can't, especially in a state like Illinois, you can't come in and say, I'm going to implement coaching. I got an agreement with my union to do that. So I'd probably save that. I Instead, I think I would talk about uh, applying um, the learning science that we know works, and we know coaching works at a very high level. There are some very specific strategies that I would, and I give people advice on this, because I think we may be the only public school district in America that has an annual instructional coaching plan for every teacher. I've not met another one, um, and we talk to people around the country on this. I hope there are others out there. If there are, contact Efren and, or contact contact me and, and I'd love to love to connect with you. But um, I think it, I think what I, what I would say based on our experiences is every district ought to look like ours in terms of the coaching. It's it's such a for me, it's always been so just interesting that in education, you know, we, we limit the learning to that that's found in a university. 
And that's important. But the learning that you do on the job in any job is actually more important. And um, the, the incubator, the sandbox that we have in our schools is the most authentic a learning space that any teacher is ever going to find. And so having supported learning in, in that uh, space um, is the most important. And I can give you a very specific aha moment in my career that, uh, that really helped drive home this point. I would love to hear it. So when I came to District 207 in 2005, we had just started training uh, with Roger and David Johnson from the University of Minnesota Cooperative Learning Center. And cooperative learning, uh, as identified by Hattie and others, is a high impact strategy. It has about a 0.59 effect size. Uh, so it's a large effect size on student learning. We had trained uh, over 300 of our teachers to use cooperative learning, but I had a sense that it wasn't being used very widely. And so I brought in an instructional audit to look at our classrooms. And here's what I found. Pretty much nobody was using cooperative learning, even though we trained all these people. But there was one group that was using cooperative learning, and that group was our trainers. So we have more Johnson & Johnson cooperative learning trainers than anybody in the world. And it's the it's the Glasser stuff, uh, which, which says, you know, we remember 10% of what we uh, hear, 25% of what we see and hear, but 95% of what we teach. And the fact that our teachers were having to activate their brain as learners to teach others made their own efficacy so much higher. And so right now, we have adult learning leaders in pretty much everything we do. Any of our staff development is led by our own teachers. Our coaches are all teachers. Every one of those people, when they go through that process report, I became a better practitioner because of coaching and leading other adults. And so... That was kind of an aha moment, but it also is, it's a design principle. So I have been in search of how do you put every adult into that leadership position to create that experience that our cooperative learning trainers had, and that's sort of set us on our journey. Um, and that's been many years ago. Now today in our classrooms, because when you come to work for us, we have a, a new teacher cohort It lasts four years. Cooperative learning is one of our foundational skills that we expect our teachers to know, do, implement, and, and operate at a professional level. You're hard pressed to go in any of our classrooms today and not see cooperative learning operating at a really, really high level. And cooperative learning, if you, if you study anybody in differentiation, they always use the term group work. Well, cooperative learning is a scientific aspect of group work, and that shows you the complexity of, of pedagogy in the classroom. So we, we use this term differentiation, and, and different people have, have different um, definition, definitions of it, but, but my definition is uh, a teacher who has the ability to, to apply multiple strategies um, in real time to, to support the best student learning for each student in their classroom. One of those strategies just happens to be cooperative learning. And um, so I literally ideate on, okay, how do we create these conditions for our teachers to have those experiences? So our newest coaching plan is coaching student teachers. I was in my office seven or eight years ago talking to a couple of, of our team members. And I said, I wonder if there's universities that would partner with us to have a program where if you were going to student teach with us, that student teacher got coached through their student teaching cycle. Now, that has tremendous value. In fact, Jill Gio Karras, who leads our adult learnings, this was her dissertation topic. And it's being studied more widely because the, the, the hypothesis is a student teacher going through coaching cycles in their student teaching, unlike mine, which is my two, my two supervising teachers kind of met me the first day and then went in the, into the teacher's lounge. I never saw them the rest of the year. So I made all these mistakes that rookies make. I didn't have anybody in the moment to kind of give me that feedback cycle and help me you know, uh, learn from those things. And, but I said, you know, I wonder if anyone one would do that because my design thinking there is, yes, it's certainly important for the teachers, but I'm thinking about my teachers, not just the student teachers, but, but that creates conditions for them. And so we, we developed a partnership with Northwestern and National Lewis. It's why we began the Chicago Coaching Center to develop the training really for our teachers. But since then, we train teachers from around the U.S. and even outside. Our, our, our first year out of the gate, we had teachers coming from like Costa Rica, 
uh, um, um, Dominican Republic to to come and, and do our training. But it's supported our own teachers now. We have a large cadre every year of our teachers who get trained to coach and support student teachers through their journey. Uh, again, the hypothesis is that they'll be more successful, these student teachers, right out of the gate. They'll be more ready to teach, and they'll stick in our profession. Two things that are really, really important to our profession. But what do we get at District 207 beyond that? Well, I get conditions for my teachers to be leaders, and that helps grow their own efficacy. So that's those are design principles that you're always looking to apply at scale um, to create those conditions for your own teacher learners to be really, really great and to give them the opportunities, because that's part of what it is, is making sure they've got the, the, the not just the one-off opportunities, but the embedded into their day opportunities um, to be really, really better, to, to practice at a more metacognitive level, their own thinking about the design principles of learning. And there's just real power in that. Your brain works differently. Any Any teacher can tell you. I was a much better English student uh, the first year that I taught English coming out of college. I learned so much more when I had to teach others. Um, I became much more proficient at, you know, the skills of wrestling when I had to coach others in wrestling than when I was just a wrestler. Your brain works differently. It works harder. It, it's got to construct at a more metacognitive level when you're leading others. And so that design principle, it's true for you. It's true for me. But the trick in, in our in our space is how do you create, you know, across everybody's classroom, how do you create uh, the conditions for that to be the, the landscape? And I'm really proud that, you know, in, in my district, that's the landscape. It's been the landscape for nine years. There's going to come a point pretty soon when every teacher that's ever worked for us is only ever known coaching. And, you know, we've got teach many teachers in our district. In fact, the majority of them have been coached for nine straight years. At some point in the future, someone's going to say, you know, I worked in District 207 for 33 years. I got coached every single year, and I think I got better every single year because the, the best teachers I've ever known, in their last year of teaching, they're still trying to chase this thing that is is the, the miracle of the job that we get to do, which is how do I really, really get at finding a way to help this student be their very best self. And if you love this calling, um, you're never done trying to figure that out. Wow. Amen. Uh, thank you, uh, Ken. Um, lovely interview so far. Uh, can you please walk us through your professional trajectory up to this point? So, yeah, I... Um, I actually didn't answer all the questions about, you know, who am I? When I was a young, I grew up in a, in a rural part of Southern Indiana. And when I was, you know, I got married young, had children young, and, and at different times was working two or three jobs. Um, I taught, but then I would I worked for farmers in the summer where I learned all kinds of things, learned a lot of construction trades, actually welding. Um, and then I actually worked in construction for several summers. I ran roofing crews. I um did all aspects of home addition and remodeling and actually did have done a lot of work on my own thing. So I've learned, uh, didn't have any formal training in that beyond on the job training. Um, but I was, um, a high school English teacher for five years, head wrestling coach, uh, got recruited back to my hometown of Princeton, Indiana, and was the head wrestling wrestling coach there for six years. And I taught middle school computer science for six years there. And then I went into, uh, got, got really encouraged by different mentors to get my administrative license. I became an assistant principal, uh, moved to central Indiana. I was in a little small town called uh, Greencastle, Indiana. It's where DePaul with a W is. And was an assistant principal and a principal, uh, and then ultimately an assistant superintendent um, in my 19th year of education. And, and um uh, it's funny, my my uh, my family used to come to the Merchandise Mart for our furniture and appliance store. And that was my first recollection of Chicago. But my youngest brother had gone to Chicago. He was he was at, in law school at John Marshall. So I used to come up all the time and visit and kind of really thought, man, this is really cool up there. And when I was doing my Ph.D. Um, at Indiana State University, Harvard of the Midwest, um, go Sycamores, 
uh, on the 12th floor of the ELAF building, we would go up on the elevator for our uh, cohort classes and on a little, um, little board, uh, bulletin board, there were a couple of job um, advertisements for Main Township High School District 207. That's how old school it was. And I thought I did a little research and looked it up and I thought, well, that's that's really cool. But um, I applied for the job of assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction and was fortunate enough to get hired here. Uh, I did that for four years. And then uh, in 2009, I became the first superintendent in District 207 history to be hired from within the district. And I'm in my 14th year now as the superintendent of District 207. Um, which ties me for the longest tenure of any superintendent in district history. And, and hopefully I'll be there next year and, uh, you know, break that record. And, and uh, it's been the privilege of a lifetime, though. I can tell you um, I've learned something on every step of the way. And I know one of your questions is, you know, some advice about this journey. And the one thing that I learned and, and I've tried to get better at it uh, every year a little bit is really growing other people. Uh, this job is is really a you're a gardener, and it's if you really you know are searching for a metaphor that works for us in education, it's it's to really be a gardener and to understand that um, it's about the learning of everyone else. Yes, you have to be a learner yourself as a, as a leader, and I really try to do that. Um, but in addition, you have to really really be growing other people because at the end of the day. The most common mistake that happens for superintendents is, you know, they, they make the journey, they make the, the conditions about themselves and their own pet projects. And that's an important thing. You've got to stand for something as a superintendent. You've got to believe in something. But the trick is to, to, to distribute the ownership of that as far down the line as you can. And that's why within our adult learning, uh, a lot of people hire outside experts to come in. Our philosophy is grow your own. So our assessment literacy trainers, there are teachers, our academic vocabulary trainers, there are teachers, our coaches, there are teachers. Um, I always, you know, I look at other districts, it's, you know, we'll hire outside coaches, for example. And it's like, why? You know, you can grow your own and you should grow your own. I'm just a big believer that that's your garden. So you tend that garden, you grow the best garden that you can, you have the most empowered learners, but that is a design principle because when you distribute the ownership and you give the ownership to the people who are there, superintendents come and go. But our adult learning program, for example, is embedded. It has a root system among our teachers, within our teachers, and it's owned by our teachers. They're union members. Um, that's gonna that's got staying power. And my my hope, my dream is that 20 years from now, 30 years from now, long after I'm gone from from District 207, that. They're in their 30th year. They're in their 40th year. Every single person who has ever worked in the district has come to a district where coaching is part of the landscape, with that adult learning is part of the landscape. And beyond coaching, people have opportunities to lead in other ways because um, um, uh, Jenny Donahue, who is John Hattie's co-researcher and author, has a new book out with Stephanie Height on collective efficacy and how to, how to, how to develop it. We're a case study in that book. And um, I think we're at our very best this year that we've ever been. Um, our district's interesting in that just we went into the 21st century with three majority high schools. Just since the turn of the 21st century, we have two of our three high schools have become non-majority. Our poverty has tripled, but our student performance is at the highest level it's ever been. In the research, if either one of those um, demographic lines happens, almost without fail, there is a inverse negative relationship with performance and our students are performing at higher levels. I'm convinced that it's because of the adult learning systems that we've got in place. And so what that does is it gives a case study, I think, of how do you arm yourself in a changing world where the complexity, the needs of your students is growing and increasing. You can't stay the same and meet that need. You've got to be improving and always, always uh, learning how to do this job better. And so I think that's the thing that um, I would give advice to any young administrator is to understand that try to, as much as you can, take your ego out of it and really be a servant leader and a craftsman leader. People hire 
uh, for charismatic leaders, but the research on charismatic leaders is that they fail way more often than they succeed. And the minute they walk out the door, everything they try to do is gone because it was about them and, and not about everybody else. And um, there's a term in the research called craftsman leader. And the craftsman leader is the builder and the distributor and the one that empowers other people to lead, really lead and have ownership of the work and the journey. And those leaders often are the most successful if they're lucky enough to, to stay. You've got to, you, this is not a one year deal. This is a, this is a decade and plus deal to really do this stuff right and to have a chance uh, to, to have something that's sustainable and, um, and then just the humility to know you're never really done. You, you never, you never get done in this. You, you know, you're always trying to get there, but, but there doesn't exist. The journey exists and, um, you just keep working to serve others and grow others and empower others and, and continue to get better. And that's not a straight line. It's a jagged line, but, uh, if you're lucky enough, um, you're lucky enough you you you'll get to see it um come to fruition and i'm i'm lucky enough to say you know i've i i i all the things we're doing now were an idea on an idea wall 15 years ago and that's pretty cool let me ask you a follow-up question what as an aspiring superintendent what principals don't know yet that will hit them when they become a superintendent well I w the first thing is that um, I, I remember being a teacher uh, and thinking about, and even an assistant principal thinking, oh, yeah, I, I think I could be a principal. I think I could be a principal. Everyone thinks they could be a principal till they sit in a chair. And um, in the same way that that hits you as a principal where you go, oh, my gosh, I, I thought I knew, but, wow, now I really know. Because the, pr the principal job in, the, in, in education in some ways is the hardest job because it's this combination – of really intense stimulation, day-to-day um, -day stimulation. So it's a lot, and, and then there's a lot of physical fatigue, especially at our level with high school principals that have a lot of extra, you know, nights and weekend stuff that they that they have to attend to. So it's this really tough combination of physical and mental um, high-level operation. The superintendency is like that, but but the, the complexity factor there is just the, the politics involved with being a superintendent. And, and I'm not by nature real political. I was, you know, I was never trying to be the class president or anything like that. Um, and, but those skills that the class president learned, superintendents need to learn them. And I've, I've had to learn them. I've had to learn how important those are. I, I won't claim at all that I'm still very good at it, but I'm learning because for me, I, I look at it. I want to look at the work like I did when I was a coach trying to, trying to take all of my kids, each of whom was really diverse and, and had different skills but yet trying to create conditions for each of them to be the best version of themselves. Um, I'm trying to still chase that. I want, that's the purity of the work, but the superintendency has this other thing where, you know, you're reporting to seven, seven different um, board members at any one time that takes a lot of bandwidth um, and you have to really attend to that. And, and um, so, so I'm, I'm, on the job in some ways, 24, seven, 365, you know, and my board will say, you know, when you go on vacation, you need to just shut it off, turn it off, but then something will come up where I really have to be present. I have to, I have to weigh in. And it's a double-edged sword because while the boards will say, look, you need your time away, you need your time off. The superintendent who then isn't available on Sunday or Saturday or Friday night or whatever to attend to things, well, those superintendents often have problems because they're not responsive and it's it, it is a really really tough job and, and the and the buck stops with you but if you're lucky enough to be able to work with a board develop a board because your superintendents really have to develop a board you're the you're the subject matter expert you're the one that's got to have the vision and you you're not just teaching the adults now or the students now you're also teaching your board members and i have very specific thoughts about you know what that looks like from a design principle not not only when you get board members, but before you get board members and how you even cultivate the conditions for uh, developing board members within a community, because that's an important part of the job. And that's the piece that you just don't know until you get there what that's like. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, Ken, like in Back to the Future, if you could go back to any of the positions you have held, what would the Ken of today 
tell the can of them? Um, be patient. Um, I've always been, you know, you know, there's a there's a thing that happens when you're a classroom teacher or a coach. Um, I can, you know, work with my students through the week. Um, you know, we, we did database spreadsheets some programming, things like that. And I can work with them and have them produce products on Thursday and Friday that are the direct result of the things that they learned in class. And so you see this tangible evidence of your work almost immediately. Um, I, you know, we, we had, we wrestled a lot on Saturday, so I'd come back and I would always take notes when we wrestle on Saturday about, okay, what it's all formative, almost everything is formative. And so I'm looking at my, my wrestlers do things really well that we worked on, have some things that, you know, maybe one team in particular has some very specific techniques that they, they're all really good at. And you don't, you didn't maybe prepare your kids as well as you needed to for those techniques. Well, you come back on you know, Monday and you say, okay, here are the things we need to work on. Here's what I saw. We reviewed film, uh, then, then really put the learning plan in place to address the things that we needed to improve upon. Then you go out and wrestle the next Saturday and you'd often see, uh, not perfect, but you'd see, okay, John's making progress here. I see, wow, he really, really had a good week of practice and he picked up some things that he needed to get better on. Maybe he was, you know, it's like a math problem. He was finishing 80% of a move, but the last 20% he was struggling on. So we worked on finishing that last 20%, and now he's at 90%, and that's progress. And being able to see that journey for that for that wrestler, um, it's having the patience to take that to scale as a, as a leader because you get much quicker feedback and evidence of your work as a teacher and a coach, and you won't as a leader. It, it's a long game, and I had to learn that. It's a long game. Um, there are things about being a teacher and a coach that help you be successful, but there are also a lot of things about being a teacher and coach that you, you frankly just have to learn differently about the, the complexity that it takes to be a leader in a building because um, the, pay, the pace at which adults lead, you know, learn is much different. And frankly, the systems are different. That's, you know, that's where we started this interview. Part of the problem in education is that unlike students who are in your classroom, sort of, you know, they, they're there to learn, they're, they're on your team, they're there to learn. Teachers we treat as subject matter experts, and they are in their subjects. That doesn't mean they're done. They're not, they're not fully formed. None of, none of us are ever fully formed. And um, it's about the, the, having the patience and knowing that it's that, that gardening metaphor that you've got to really uh, grow your allies, grow your leaders, and then distribute the ownership of the work. And that takes patience and design thinking, and it takes years, frankly, to do it well. And and it takes years to get to the place where you can begin to do it well. And then it's the sticking power and the persistence and the long-term thinking and the vision for for everything you do. Everything we do now, you know, I, I, I imagined what it would look like, you know, 10, 12 years ago to be in a district where, gosh, you've been coaching everybody. You're 30 years in. Everybody's ever worked here. That's their landscape. And I thought, how cool is that going to be? I'm not going to get to see it uh, 30 years from now or 20 years from now, but but hopefully somebody else will. And it's going to make our organization better. And that's, and that's maybe the last thing is just remember that as a leader, you know, your time is limited in this work. And if you're doing it well, you're growing a team and others behind you to pass that baton to and to have them be mission driven. And that's part of that is also selecting the right people to be on your team, the people who, who, for whom this isn't a job, it's a calling and really trying to get that, um, that sustained. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, Ken, as you know, reading books is a maximum luxury. Uh, if you will have to give two books to a loved one, your favorite fiction book and your favorite nonfiction book, what would those be? So I'm going to start with fiction. I saw this this head, and, and the truth is um, – my my dissertation study was was how humans learn how to read, write, speak, and listen, and 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 in the in the research, males tend to prefer nonfiction um, more, and uh, so I have to go back to uh, Jack London's Call of the Wild for one of my favorite uh, nonfiction books. But I was probably reading that when I was eight years old. Um, 
And then I am a, I'm a, I'm a nonfiction reader. Um, you know, uh, a couple of books that I've just led book studies on upstream by Dan Heath is outstanding from a design thinking principle. And then I just finished, um, with uh, a book study with some superintendents and I'm actually doing it with my cabinet team right now, Adam Grant's originals. And both of those are about, you know, designs of leadership and uh, sort of confronting conventional wisdom. And, and, and I'm not, you know, someone that I'm typically not someone that's known for just following the herd. Um, I like to think, um, if everybody's going in the same direction, my first instinct is to be skeptical and to, to ask questions, which doesn't always make you the most popular person. You know, that thing that about, you know, being the class president, and those political skills. Um, when you're a superintendent who doesn't just follow the herd, sometimes you you can be looked down upon for that. And uh, you've got to be OK with that, because I would you know, I, I know where I'm at right now and where our district is at. Um you know, we we set a course for that, and 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 now I'm in a position where once a week at least I've got a district that reaches out and wants to know about some things we're doing for either our adults or our students. Uh, so so I feel like we're on the right track for that. But um, anyway, uh, I hope that's I hope that answer answers the question a little bit. It's it's really just understanding that it's a long game, and you've really got to grow others. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Ken. Ken, uh, who is or who are your biggest influences? Um, I grew up in a time when, um, you know, uh, I wouldn't say the pedagogy that I grew up with was the best uh, in terms of teaching. It was just a lot of rote memorization. I was a bored student. Um, I was, I was, you know, I, I, I was talented enough, but I didn't maximize my talent because I was just bored. But two teachers in particular uh, stuck with me, and one was uh, Gary Cat, who was my high school uh, algebra teacher. And I had gone to a Catholic grade school in my town, and then I, I went to the public high school. And um, a lot of kids that, you know, I was, I, I kind of knew through Little League or things like that, but just a different, much different framework from growing up with 30 kids for eight, eight, eight different grades. And Early in my freshman year, uh, I started high school when I was 13, we had an assessment on something. I don't even remember what the topic was, but as a class, we didn't do very well in it. And I remember Mr. Cat um, meeting us like on Monday and saying, you know, I didn't do a very good job of preparing you for this uh, exam. And we worked on the material and we retook it. Now, I know, Efren, that I didn't go home and tell my parents about that. I don't even think I talked to any friends about that. But for some reason, that stuck with me. I never forgot that. And the reason that it stuck is because it was so rare. It was in a rare occurrence. Um, an old wrestling coach said one time, there's two ways to learn. One is by shock and the other is by repetition. And repetition is generally how we learn. Shock is just a metaphor. And that was a shock to me to hear a teacher for the first time in my life, I'm pretty sure, admit that my actions have a relationship to your learning. I'd never heard that. I never forgot it. And it stuck with me. And then the second one was Tom Rivers, who was one of my English professors um, at the University of Southern Indiana. And he's the first person that introduced me to heuristics, which is, you know, the, the, the skill of developing questions as a problem solving method. And it was, and, and he really practiced that in his, in his classrooms. And so it was the first time in my life that the work was more about the questions than about the answers. And that threw me for a loop. And it just, it really turned my world upside down there for a while. But it helped me really re rethink everything that I thought I knew about learning, helped me become a better English teacher because I really, uh, I used to tell my students, you know, half of an answer is a question and it's the most important half. And so we really practiced that I was a writing teacher. We really practiced that, you know, heuristics in my classroom. So those two folks had a great influence on me. My grandfather and grandmother had a great influence on me, um, you know, throughout the course of my life. And then I, I've been fortunate enough to work um, with just really amazing people uh, throughout my career, but in particular here at Main Township, people who had opened me up to a world um, of just the complexity and the beauty of 
of this big, diverse uh, district that in many, many ways is a, is a, a microcosm of our country. And uh, people like David Barker, who used to talk about, you know, the problem we've got is we've got too many students coming here. They're under dreamed. And um, and that stuck with me. And and um, David was early. You know, he was an early pioneer, I'd say, in this state in second language learning uh, education. And um, and so I've just been really fortunate, really blessed. I've had many, many great board members that I've worked for, many great principals, great assistant superintendents, great, great teachers, some of the best teachers anywhere or in our in, or in our district. And I'm so proud of that. I, I tell our community members, you, you won't find a better educational experience for your students than in our classrooms because of, of the work that we put into, you know, making the variable that matters the most, the quality of teaching in the classroom, uh, it's very best. And so, um, you know, it's not just one person. It's it's a combination of a lot of people. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Ken. Ken, how do you deal with imposter syndrome? Well, I think everybody has that at some point. I remember, you know, when I was trying to be a better wrestler as a kid and um, really working hard and just putting my head down and grinding. My Chinese symbol is the ox, and the ox is someone that just, you know, they strap on the plow and, and they go just build, they, they, they cultivate and they work. And so I, I learned early in life at a very, I got my first job when I was nine years old. I learned early in life that there's this symbiotic relationship to how hard you work and what the outcome is. And I think the best way to combat imposter syndrome is to be real, be authentic, um, be about the learning. And there's plenty of imposters in our work. Um, uh, you know, that's one of the things that, that the reason that I never cared for politics is that the closer you pay attention to politics, you realize just how many imposters there are in the world. And by nature, I sort of rate people as, you know, those who have a, a BS meter and can smell an imposter. Um, I, I, those tend to be my people. And my problem is that I often call imposters for what they are. And I'm much more, have much more respect for the craftsman leader, puts his head down, humbly, respectfully learns and just builds. And uh, what I can point to for myself is that our outcomes for our students are better than they've ever been, despite uh, students that are poor and more diverse than they've ever been. And so the way that you combat imposter syndrome is to actually do the real work, be about the work, not about building your own brand. There's too much of in our business of people who just want to build their own brand and hype themselves um, instead of actually having a foundation for for being legit and being authentic. And um, to me, the people who actually do the craftsman leaders who build the work, the servant leaders who do the work, because now you're serving other people. You're truly serving your students. And if you're not doing that, um, there's no way that you can you can not be an imposter in my book. You've got to be about serving the students and the adults that, that serve the students. Thank you so much. As you know, Ken, being successful includes being on top of our productivity, but this means different things for different people. How do you get things done and still have a fructiferous life? Well, I um, try to take care of myself, first of all. So I'm an avid mountain biker, and um, I've also got a fitness center here in my in my uh, uh, in my home, so that I'm getting my wife uh, uh, the the our oat milk, so she can have coffee this morning, and. Uh, <laughs> Um, that's an important thing here. And so, um, I, I make sure that, um, you know, I'm trying to take, take care of myself and be healthy. And that's a, that's a real important, um, uh, lesson for any leader is to take care of yourself because if you can't take care of yourself, uh, you can't take care of others. Um, and I'm going to go back to that question. So the, the other thing is, um, in terms of organization, that that um, <clears throat> that's where that distribution really matters. Uh, a superintendent, you know, you have to 
both have the 30,000 foot view level, but you've got to be granular when you need to be granular and, um, and detailed where you, you, you've got to be detailed. But, but at the end of the day, you've really got to, got to pick really good team members and you've got to trust them. You've got to grow them. You've got to learn with them, um, set high expectations for them, um, and have some regular things that you do to check in, um, on my team. I'm really proud. The, the the district goals, the strategic planning, if you will, it's my goals. It's my goals with the board. It's it's my it's my goals and my commitment to our community, which is here are the things we're going to work on. We measure them. We're always in a journey to get better at them. Uh, a big thing in my district is each of our students has an indiv- individual career plan. It's really, really a complex, high level of support for students. Um, but I think it's the most important problem to solve for for our students leaving high school. <coughs> we're actually trying to measure how successful our students are five years after they leave us. Um, and that's a much higher bar uh, to, to, to clear. But I, I can't do that without having a team of people who know and understand and are committed to building the systems to help us uh, both create better outcomes for students after they leave us, but then also measure it and collect the data because the data is a big piece of the, of the question. You know, anybody can say, yeah, we're doing really, really well, but having the data to support that claim is what matters. And that's the, that's the putting your head down, doing the work and holding yourself accountable. And that really is, is at the end of the day, I think what matters the most. If you're holding yourself accountable, you'll put organizational structures in place to make sure that you're monitoring that. I see. So let me ask you. So you have your, you have your team and how do they uh, report to you in terms of productivity, right? In terms of getting things done, do you guys have a list? Do you guys have a, a working document? How is that yeah. organization? So so we have strategic planning that we do every year. And after the goals, most of the goals in our strategic plan, we've been working on for a decade. So for example, it's growing the number of career experiences that our students get. That's not just my goal with the board. That's our principal's goals. That's our assistant principal's goals. So it cascades into the system. So we have a threaded set of goals, um, improving our adult learning. Those things have been in place for a decade and they cascade throughout the system. And, and so from a design principle, you want to make sure if my goals matter to me and the board and the community, they ought to matter to the classroom teacher. So it's, it part of the trick is, is really picking good goals that, that you don't, if you, if you complete a goal in a year, it probably wasn't a very meaningful goal. The goals that we set, they're journey goals, and it's to continue perfecting what we're doing uh, as a learning organization to try to serve our students better. And um, those goals are complex and they're never done. And so um, I, the goals that I set with the board, I also set those goals with our cabinet team they have they, those become the organi- or, organizing structures for the cabinet and the building and the teachers and so there's a there's a there's a you know there's a there's connective tissue and bandwidth if you will between those goals and those become our organizational structures so yes we're collecting a ton of data i've got you know when i do my uh, updates for the board i have longitudinal data that's you know 10 15 years old so we've got these graphs of trajectories how many uh, we we use a rigor index, and those are the number of college courses that our students take. Last year, for the first time in history, our students took over 7,000 college courses, 7,420 to be exact. So why do I know that? Because I'm always looking at the data, and the data is throughout our system, and we continue to grow it. And when I started this as a superintendent, our kids were taking about 2,000 college courses. So when you plot that over time, and our Hispanic students college course enrollment since that time has grown over 400%. Our black wow. student enrollment has grown over 800%. So the fight that we've got in my district is our most privileged, traditionally most privileged people think that if we do something good for our traditionally excluded students, that somehow we're hurting someone. But my white and Asian students have grown over 120% in that time, and they were already well overrepresented, but they're taking more college courses than they've ever taken. So those are, I mean, so those goals are, you could, you could, you can frame those goals in a lot of different ways. You can frame them as, okay, just taking college courses, but you know what, where else they fit? They're equity goals. 
because mm -hmm. our Hispanic students, for example, have been traditionally excluded from those courses. They're not anymore. And, and so how do you create the systems to not only have the, it's, it's one thing to give students access, but, but giving access without the enrichment that, that allowed more privileged students to be there in the first place is, is a design flaw. So, so we have a responsive MTS systems. We have a daily early warning system that is more of a medical model to make sure that, you know, we're not just giving access to students who traditionally haven't been in those classes. We're making sure that we've got real time support so that they're successful. And that's, that's what's actually happened. So if you want to change the world, that's, that's how you, that's how you do it. I see. And how do you then address, for example, your email and calendar? How, how, what is your, um, your um, art behind the laptop? Well, first of all, the calendar is is my brain. So if it if it's not my calendar, it doesn't happen. And in fact, here, true story this morning, um, I have alarms on my calendar. So I literally fell asleep and forgot that we had this podcast. But 10 <laughs> minutes before seven, my phone starts dinging. And I think, oh, crap, I've got to do a podcast. So I get up, I, I throw on a hat, I, uh, you know, get a cup of coffee, and here I am. And that's, that is that's the that's the best case study I can yeah. give you. My calendar is is really my own because I've got so much I have a lot of stimulation coming at me. And then my email, I gotta admit, my email game is is probably weak. But the problem is is that I just get inundated with way too many emails and, and a lot of solicitations. And um and so I have a lot of noise going on in my email box. I probably should just delete everything and start over. I did that <laughs> one. I did that once when I had about 90,000 emails that I hadn't deleted, and, but I'm back up to probably 50. So, uh, but I do, what, what I do is I do pay attention. I do look in from time to time. I make sure that I answer the, the priority ones, but there's so much, there's so much traffic in my inbox that it's, it's easy to get something lost because there's just so much traffic in there. So I can't, and I'm not going to sit every day and just monitor my email every minute of every day. Um, So I, 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 I'm in search of, of, I'm in progress on that one. My calendar game is good. My email game, I, I can't say that. Yeah, I, I've got some work to do there. Okay, But thank I do, you. I, I am responsive. I will tell you this. If a parent emails me on Saturday, odds are I'm going to respond to them. I shouldn't, but I do. I re, I'm pretty responsive. I definitely, I respond to my board members. I respond to my team members, and um, I, I definitely do that. Thank you. And how do you make a, a list of the things you need to do? Do you just go straight to the calendar? How do you capture your ideas as the day goes by? Uh, calendar is mostly I, I, I put everything in the calendar, even a reminder to think about things, to to uh, explore a topic. I, I put it in the calendar as a reminder. I, I look for, okay, when am I going to have time to, to, to uh, research this? And I literally put it in my calendar to research something. So I do that all the time and that helps me because it's like, okay. And, and I remember why I, I wanted to do that. So something will come up in a conversation. I think I, I want to follow up on that. I put in the calendar and that becomes my organizational structure. I see. And how do you uh, think about when you have to communicate with your staff, like, or, or you have to write letters, uh, messages uh, as a superintendent, you know, you're always getting hit with things and, How do you organize yourself or, or, or what advice do you have when you have to sit down and actually write something to your staff? Um, I, I tend to, I, I think, I, I think I was a former writing teacher and I was a writer and uh, I think I'm always writing something in my head. Um, you know, I'm always preparing a presentation in my head. And so I'm always constructing my first draft in my head And then um, I tend to, uh, depending on the nature of the communication, you know, I use uh, Google Docs almost exclusively, but then I will share my thinking. It, 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 depending on the level and, and who, whose eyes can see it, I share often my drafts with others just to get input for, okay, does this messaging sound okay? Or there, is there something I forgot? Uh, and just getting other perspectives on, on my writing you know, the clarity, the tone, all of those kind of things. Um, in messages to staff, I'm generally just trying to be positive and uplifting and and celebratory or informative. Um, 
you know, one of the big things that I've been sharing with our staff here is just some of the research on information literacy. And that's the, you know, being able to debunk uh, fact from fiction, which I think is one of the great responsibilities we've got in public education right now. And it's getting tougher and tougher to do. Uh, I was just reading Scientific American yesterday, a, a, an article about this, that students as, as young as 14, 13, 14, they're, they're starting to, you know, buy into uh, some of the conspiracy theories out there that don't have any basis in fact, and, and, and they're coming to school with that. And so, uh, you know, how, what responsibility do we have, for example, to uh, inform a student that, that the, 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 the um, you know, 2000 election was won by Joe Biden and the, and the, and, and the evidence is overwhelming of that. The empirical evidence is overwhelming of that. A, do we have a responsibility to teach the truth? I think we do. Uh, B, then how do we go about it knowing that uh, any topic is can be politically charged? And most students, as you know, if they have that belief themselves, odds are their parents have that belief. And um, so, so it's, a, it's a much, much bigger problem. But I think I can't help but... Um, but believe that if we stand for anything in education, we have to stand for the truth. We have to stand for being scientific and empirical. If, if truth no longer, uh, if it ceases to be our standard, heaven help us, heaven help us. And, and I, I feel a, a duty. In fact, as long as I'm doing this work, it's going to be about the truth. We may not agree, <laughs> but the truth, is, you know, the truth has, has, has pieces to it that can withstand the light of day. The lies don't. And I think, um, you know, that one calling, that one mission, that, that, that's a really big deal. Um, and, and I spend a lot of time sharing information with my staff about that. And, you know, one of our coaching plans is action research. I've got teachers who do action research on strategies to help students figure out how to discern fact from fiction. It's a really cool thing. And um, a lot of my teachers are really in this, and 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 bigger than that, it's one of our language arts standards now, um, in the in the listening standard, which is being able to discern fact from fiction. It's much more than just did you plagiarize. It's what's the truth and what's not the truth, and what are what are um, legitimate sources, and how do you how do you find a claim, and and really discern whether that claim is true or not, and and that has to be a foundational piece of what we do in education. Thank you so much, uh, Ken. Um, in terms of exercise, I noticed uh, your tweets about mountain biking and stuff like that. Can you tell us a little bit about why exercise is important for you? Well, <clears throat> you know, the, the science of exercise is 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 uh, is is solid. You know, is at, at any time in our life, but certainly as we age, it's so important on your mental health. It's so important on your physical health. It's important in your balance. Um, I was a college wrestler and mountain biking at my age is the exercise that I can do that feels the most like that kind of workout when I was in college. And, and so uh, what's interesting is, you know, when I, when I turned 59 and 60, I really uh, started, I, I actually leaned into mountain biking harder than I had for a long, long time. Uh, just, just kind of a place where I was in my life and uh, got myself in better shape, lost some weight. I actually started setting PRs like on a regular basis. Um, I don't know if I can, I'll, I'll see this summer. I, I intend to try to get back at it and see if I can get back to that level because it was really cool going out on tracks. I tracked myself on Strava and at the, you know, being 60 years old and setting a PR on a trail that I've been riding for seven years. Um, that's pretty inspiring when you're 60 years old to say, wow, I am better than I was, you know, when I was 52 or 53. And um, that's a, that's another journey that I'm on is just try to stay as physically fit as I can be um, for all the reasons that everybody knows already. But but for me, it helps me be my best version of myself. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm calmer. I'm more relaxed. I have better clarity. I do some of my best thinking on the bike. And Again, I, I, I've had to improve in this area because I would say 15, 20 years ago, I wasn't doing nearly as well at this. And there was a cost for that, uh, probably professionally and personally. So I, I, you know, if, if listeners listen, you know, take one thing away today, it's really try to take care of yourself physically because it is truly important. Beautiful. Thank you so much. 
Ken, this has been such a great conversation. Anything else you would like to share with the listeners of the show? No, just, you know, thank you for listening. And, and uh, you can always reach me. Uh, my email is kwallace at main207.org. Um, and um, feel free to reach out anytime and uh, come visit if you want. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of our schools. We have just are finishing rebuilding all of them. They're magnificent buildings, and we've, we've reoriented the learning spaces to re better reflect how we do learning in the 21st century. So I'm super proud of that, too. And uh, if you're listening to this, that means you care about learning, and, and that makes you my kind of people. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you so much, Ken, for being here. I feel illuminated. Uh, I'm so glad that we did this. All right. Well, thank you for having me, Efren. Thank you, and happy Saturday. Yes, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.